Hello everyone, I'm here with Howie Hawkins. He is the co-founder of the National Green Party in the United States and he's currently seeking the nomination of the Green Party. He just announced that his running mate will be Angela Walker and there's a lot happening with his campaign. Howie, thank you so much for coming on the program. Well, thanks for having me. Is it okay if I call you Howie? Everybody does. Okay, okay, that's easy. It's uh, the, only, it, the only primary I lost in the Green Party primary is somebody put Howard on the ballot. <laughs> and that reminded I got only time I got called Howard is when I was in when I was a kid. So everybody calls me Howard. That's fine. Yeah. See, I, I same is kind of true for me. I go by Mike. Um, and when people call me Michael, like online and whatnot, like my my family calls me Michael. But when I see someone online call me Michael, it fe it feels really weird. So it's like don't don't do that. So I thought I'd ask beforehand. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the program. Um, it's not often that we get a presidential contender on, but I, I just kind of wanted you to be able to explain what your campaign is about because my audience, if if you're not aware or familiar with them. Um, they are largely supportive of Bernie Sanders or were. And judging from the response that I've seen, there's a lot of people that feel very disappointed, very demoralized. And I've seen, you know, a sentiment that, you know, many of them want to check out of electoral politics altogether. So what is your message to these individuals who feel like all hope is lost? There's nothing we can do. What do you say to these types of people? Well, I think Bernie showed there's a lot of support for the progressive reforms he talked about. And some people say he created that. I think he just gave voice to a lot of sentiment that was already there, like Medicare for all. You can check the polling. They used to call it national health insurance, going back to Truman. And it's always polled more favorably than those opposed, usually in a substantial majority, occasionally a plurality. So he gave voice and particularly at a time when, you know, healthcare is becoming harder and harder to access. And the same thing with inequality. We've had 45 years of stagnant wages, housing and healthcare and college for the kids have gone through the roof. And so people are retiring with no savings. Some of them are still paying student loans. I know a woman who comes out of the civil rights movement, named Coley Clark, she was Medgar Evers' assistant, active in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, went north with King to Chicago. She finally got into college in the 80s. She's on Social Security now, and they're garnishing her Social Security checks to pay student loans. It's ridiculous. So Bernie expressed what people were feeling. Now, for people to say it's hopeless, it's exactly what the corporate power structure wants, because they don't want to have to pay attention to you. They want to, you know, ignore you if you don't vote. And I would say if you settle for Biden, they can take you for granted. You get lost in the sauce. You vote for Biden, he's against Medicare for all. He said he'd veto it if it crossed his desk as president. So what I'm saying is the Green Party is where you can continue to fight for those things through November and beyond. And so don't waste your vote. You know, make your vote count. Make people hear what you want. And then make the politicians come to you. Yeah. So to the Sanders people, I think we're the logical place where they should go to keep fighting for the things they were fighting for. Yeah, and I think it's so important because when you consider the fact that 100 million Americans basically don't vote, that's really scary. Like that doesn't bode well for the health and longevity, frankly, frankly, of our democracy. So not participating, even though, you know, admittedly myself, I kind of felt like I just want to disengage from electoral politics. That is exactly what the corporate power structure, you know, the capitalist system wants. And so long as you are active and still voting and making your voice heard, I do think that there's hope. But it's when all of us check out, that's when I really feel like, you know, um, then all hope is lost. So I appreciate you saying that. Now, one thing that I have always admired about the Green Party is that they are the closest ideologically to me. So when it comes to you and Bernie Sanders, there is actually some really substantive differences that I appreciate. So first and foremost, one of the major differences is that you are explicitly pro-BDS. On top of that, you support reparations for American descendants of slavery. So talk through a little bit of your policy platform. And also, as I understand it, you were the main founder of the Green New Deal. So a lot of the Green Party policies and their platform has been popularized by the progressive left that's fighting within the Democratic Party to an extent. But tell us about your platform and what you're choosing to run on currently. Okay, well, 
at the broad scale, you know, Bernie calls himself a democratic socialist, and I think he's missing two of the fundamentals of democratic socialism. And this goes back to Marx and Engels summing up the failure of the 1848 revolutions to try to get the franchise for working people. And they were in alliance. These are revolutions spread across Europe and in, into Latin America. And <clears throat> it was the working people and the new middle classes, the professionals and the new rising business class fighting the landed elite to be included in the government. The landed elite made a compromise, let the middle class in, told the working class, you don't get to vote. So Marx and Engels, you know, told the movement, we got to have our own party. We can't rely on the professionals and the business people as reliable allies. So that's one independent working class political action. The other is Bernie wants to tax the billionaire class in order to fund social programs, social programs we should have. The problem is the billionaire class still has concentrated economic power and that translates into concentrated political power. So they can resist and roll back the social programs. So what we got to do is have a socialist economic democracy based on social ownership and democratic administration of the major means of production so that the people, not a capitalist elite, makes the investment decisions and, uh, you know, has control of the economy and they have political equality. Democracy needs socialism, political democracy you really can't get until you have economic democracy. So that was, you know, the foundation of the socialist program, a socialist economy. And Bernie, while he makes gestures to it, like he wanted to promote worker co-ops, he talked about public energy in his Green New Deal. But he also said when he gave his speeches on socialism, I'm not about, he called it government ownership. You know, government can be your municipality. I think you want to decentralize as much as possible. Social ownership can also mean cooperative. So but that aside, you know, he wasn't about changing who owns the major means of production, which is central to the socialist platform. So that's on the broad scale. In terms of the issues I'm raising, I'm leading with what I consider three life or death issues. The climate crisis, which is where the Green New Deal comes in. The inequality crisis. Inequality kills. Working class life expectancies are declining. So we call for an economic bill of rights. And we can talk about how these different programs would work, but the right to a job and income above poverty, affordable housing, comprehensive health care, public education from pre-kindergarten child care through post-secondary, colleges, universities, technical and trade schools, continuing adult education, and finally, a secure retirement. And I want to double Social Security benefits to do that. So that's a life or death issue because for basically the bottom half of the income spectrum, every month it's like, if you have to go to the doctor, it's a crisis. You have to skip rent or utility payments and put you in trouble. Or you skip the doctor's appointment and you might die. A man, the man that lived downstairs from me last year, he had to get kidney medicine. He's on Medicaid. The Medicaid didn't pay for the kidney medicine. And when it came to the end of winter, March, he decided to pay his utility bill and skip the medicine that month. His kidneys failed by mid-April. That kind of thing happens too often. So that's the second life or death issue. The third is this new nuclear arms race. We're modernizing our nuclear forces. The strategic nukes are six times faster. Launch on warning isn't the issue anymore. You launch when you think the other side might launch. So the hair triggers closer than ever. We got tactical nukes in, conven uh, in conventional forces <clears throat> with the military doctrine that we can escalate the de-escalate. So if you're losing a conventional war, you use tactical nukes, and then you say, well, de-escalate. De Russians have the same doctrine. That's insanity. I mean, Daniel Ellsberg's last book was The Doomsday Machine. And the point was that, and he used to be a nuclear war planner before he was a Vietnam war planner. He said, once the nukes start flying, it's basically automated. They're all going, and we're dead. So we need to, and, and this is a you know, major part of my program, Deep cuts in military spending, I'm saying 75%. Get out of these seven official wars we're involved in. Get out of special operations in over 100 countries. Start bringing our troops home. <clears throat> and then take some nuclear disarmament initiatives. Pledge no first use. Disarm to a minimum credible deterrent. And on the basis of all those tension-reducing initiatives, go to the nuclear powers 
and say, we want complete and mutual nuclear disarmament. According to a treaty that was agreed to by 122 nations in July 2017, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And hardly anybody in this country knows about it because none of the presidential can candidates in any party are really talking about this issue, let alone having putting forward proposals for disarmament. So those are my three leading issues. They're life or death issues. And then the fourth one that always comes up is, well, you're going to spoil the election for Biden. You know, no, the Democrats are spoiling the election because since Nader ran, we've been promoting a proven nonpartisan solution, which is get rid of the Electoral College and go to a ranked choice national popular vote. Then you can vote for what you want without helping your worst enemy. And the Democrats have never picked that up. Instead, they blame the Russians and the Green Party. And that's not dealing with reality. So these are things that we're trying to raise. And then you, you mentioned a couple issues, um, reparations and BDS. Well, start with BDS. I'm generally against economic sanctions. They hurt the people more than they hurt the people you're trying to target. And right now, in this coronavirus thing, a lot of these countries were sanctioning need aid and trade to deal with the coronavirus crisis. And they were having problems before this. Um, the exception is when an oppressed people asks for that kind of support. And I was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement, seeking divestment and U.S. sanctions against South Africa, which we finally got in 86. I was very involved from the Soweto uprising in 76 until Congress over overrode Reagan's veto of sanctions. And that very quickly got the South African elite to say, you know, we can continue to exploit and oppress Africans here, or we can do business with the rest of the world. And they chose business. And although South Africa is still a very unequal society, they don't have the formal racial barriers. So that worked. And we got the same kind of situation in Israel, Palestine. And the Palestinian movement's very united around boycott, divestment, sanctions. So I support them. And the way I would apply it is in steps. So you don't just shoot all your bullets in, in one blast. And the first thing which the movement there is calling for, the National BDS Committee, uh, Omar, Mar Omar Barghouti is the prominent leader there, is, is military sanctions. We should start cutting military aid to Israel until they start respecting Palestinian human rights and negotiate in good faith for a resolution. Instead, we got the Trump administration about to approve, you know, give their, you know, house of, uh, what do you call it, stamp of approval on... Uh, Netanyahu annexing the settlements in the West Bank, which is exactly the opposite of where we go. The U.S. cannot, you know, basically have a position, Israel, right or wrong. It should be neutral. They should be for the human rights of everybody living there. And BDS, I think, can contribute to that. As far as reparations goes, absolutely. The next step is a commission to study reparations for African Americans. I think we need to study it and have this commission because African-American community needs to be heard from in terms of what they need from reparations. There's always been a debate how much it should be individual and how much should be collective. In other words, African-American families have on average one-tenth the wealth of white families. They need, you know, some money to make, you know, repair the damage that's been done by slavery, Jim Crow, ongoing discrimination. And, you know, people say, well, that's a long time ago. Well, what about during the Obama administration, black America lost half its wealth because the corporate criminals that did predatory lending and foreclosures and then the, the robo signing, which was just basically computerized fraud to steal people's homes, uh, they were not prosecuted. In fact, two of them are in the Trump administration now, Steve Mnuchin and Wilbur Ross. And they were right in the middle of the robo signing. Mnuchin and One West was notorious predatory lender and forecloser. So, that happened in the last decade. So this is, you know, something that needs to be repaired right now. But these are the things that need to be studied. The collective side is if you give people cash in an economy that still has institutionalized racism and capitalist exploitation, the capitalists are going to end up with that money when people spend it. So how do we change the system? When the modern reparation movement started, James Foreman, who came out of SNCC, and they had a black economic development conference in Detroit and he came up with the Black Manifesto and he took it to the Riverside Church 
in the manner that the churches and synagogues fund black newspapers, TV stations, and radio stations, and a black research institute as institutions that would help the black community come to grasp with their situation and, and advance, you know, educate people through the media and advance policy solutions. So those are the kinds of things the commission would study. And uh, I would add that there are other groups that need reparations. There are Mexican Americans in New Mexico whose land has been lost against the Treaty of Hidalgo Guadalupe, which was what settled the War of 1848 when the U.S. basically took half of Mexico. And those people had land rights that have been violated. And of course, uh, Indian treaty rights. There's 370 treaties with indigenous people. Lands has been stolen against those treaties and services that the federal government is supposed to provide have not been. So there needs to be an honoring of those Indian treaty rights and bringing those services and that land back into their possession. So, and then the other people are, and this overlaps with the black community and the brown community is the war on drugs, the devastation it did to communities. We need a truth, ju truth, justice and reconciliation commission. So people can talk about what happened to their communities and what needs to be done to repair them. Because, you know, all the people put in prison for possessing drugs, that's most of what the people that went to prison, uh, you know, destroyed families, uh, evacuated large portions of communities of young males, and it was devastating. So that's another area where we need reparations. Yeah. And I, everything that you say, I agree with 100 percent, which is really, you know, it, it's nice because when we we talk about politicians in any of the two major parties, even if you find agreement, you're going to find vigorous like disagreement in other areas. Whereas with the Green Party, your policies mostly line up with myself ideologically. But one of the most important things that I really respect the Green Party for is your relentless advocacy for ranked choice voting, because this isn't to me just about voting, you know, for who is someone I agree with. Like, I genuinely want power structures to be infiltrated by outsiders like the Green Party and whatnot. So can you talk through about what ranked choice voting nationally would look like and how we would get that? Because we know that in the state of Maine, uh, this was approved via ballot initiative. And now we see a relatively competitive race with a third party candidate, a Green Party candidate, Lisa Savage. So if we got ranked choice voting, um, we're not necessarily just talking about a third party in terms of the Green Party. We're talking about a huge step forward in terms of a multi-party system. One, why do you think Democrats refuse to adopt this? And I think we both know the answer, but I, you know, I think it's cathartic to hear, you know, why from you. And also, too, how do you think, as you know, a collective left, Greens, socialists, independents, we can make ranked choice voting a reality? Well, I think the Dems are worried that a third party will get established. Their instinct with the Greens is to keep us off the ballot. You know, I'll just talk about our experience in New York. We have to get a substantial petition done before we had a ballot line, and they always challenged us. And even when we did have a ballot line, like this year, the DNC with that uh, national firm, law firm that worked for Clinton and the DNC, one of the partners is named Coey, forget the other name, prominent law, Washington law firm, went to court and said, as the coronavirus lockdown started, um, we're challenging the green signatures and the green signatures were good. You know, we went to enroll greens and they were good uh, petitions and said, we're challenging them, but we don't want the board of election to review them because of the coronavirus crisis for public health reasons. Therefore, knock the greens off the ballot. And we defeated them on that, but that was their instinct. And then under the cover of the coronavirus crisis, the state budget attached to it, uh, tripling the ballot access requirements for the Green Party to keep our ballot in terms of votes in this election. And if we don't get it, uh, tripling the number of signatures we got to get from 15,000 to 45,000 in a six week window. And when you're petitioning, you really need double. So 90,000 signatures in a six week window. You know, we do it with volunteers. Um, the Democrats, they got a lot of money. They could pay people to do that. But that's a real barrier. So the New York Times, when they heard about this plan, they called it the Democrats' secret plan to kill third parties. So that's why the Democrats, they don't want a democracy. They want to take the left for granted. And so I think that's what motivates them. Uh, but there are progressive Democrats who've got behind it. We have ranked choice voting in about 20 cities. 
They passed it in Maine, the, the, the Democrats, progressive Democrats up there, as well as libertarians and, you know, just sort of those practical Democrats and Republicans you have up there in New England, town meeting country, where, you know, those elected officials in the state legislature, they, they sort of have to be accountable to those town meetings because those town meetings can, you know, call them to task too. So different kind of political culture than most of the country. So I think that helped. Um, so, yeah, ranked choice voting, you know, people should understand it. You rank your choices, one, two, three. Take the Nader, uh, Florida thing. Just to, so There were a lot of candidates, but just have Nader, Bush, and Gore. The, more of Nader's supporters, second choice would have been Gore over Bush. So what happens in ranked choice voting, if nobody gets the majority in the first round, the last place candidate's eliminated, and their ballots switch to their second choice. So in that election, Nader's vote would have switched to Gore, and he would have won handily. Um, so that eliminates the spoiler problem, the incentive to vote for the lesser evil to stop your worst enemy. Um, the other thing ranked choice voting can do is get proportional registration, re proportional representation in legislatures. It's called the single transferable vote. So the counting is a little more complicated. It's the same principle, but, and there are bills in Congress for this. You have multi-member districts and you rank your choices in order of preference. And the end result is each party gets representation in proportion to the support they got. So that's in contrast to the plurality winner system we have right now. So I, I ran in this district where I'm sitting right now about nine years ago now, and I got 48% of the vote. And the person that got 52% got all the power. My vote didn't get any representation. And that leads to tyrannies of majorities or sometimes tyrannies of minorities because the plurality wins. And that's that's not right. This is a system of, of uh, voting, plurality winner, that was invented in the late Middle Ages in England in 1430. They made the sheriff, instead of taking what he thought was the consensus of all the property owners in his shire, he had to go out and actually count them. And the plurality uh, candidate would then go to the House of Commons. You know, we're, what are we now? Six, almost 600 years later. It's time for a, an update. Yeah, an the, upgrade. System, the system is antiquated. And to kind of put this into context for people, when we talk about multi-member districts, the districts that we're all in, we get one representative, right? So the person with the plurality, if they get 45% of the vote, that they win, right? The 65% gets no representation. So if we just increased the district magnitude to two, in that instance, in your race, you as well as your opponent would have gone to Congress. And let's say, hypothetically speaking, you know, we had someone with 45%, someone with 30%, and someone with 10%. It, the people, like the majority of people would have someone representing them, representing their voice, whereas the 10% would be left out if the district magnitude were two, for example. But it just it makes things more representative. It's more proportional and it's more democratic. And so I totally agree. And this is why I've really been trying to push ranked choice voting for so long, because it helps to make marginalized voices electorally actually um, take positions of power, which is important. Now, speaking of, you know, being disenfranchised as a non-mainstream candidate, you were recently suspended from Twitter. You got your account back. And this isn't necessarily a new phenomenon. You know, third party candidates, uh, you know, activists, social media does tend to marginalize them to a degree. Indie media on YouTube kind of is doing the same thing to us currently. So can you talk a little bit about what was that all about? Because I heard that you were banned from Twitter. I thought it was outrageous. Um, but you're back. But what what happened? Well, they said I was impersonating myself. <laughs> I, you know, how do you do that? And, you know, it was just a two or three sentence message. They didn't talk to me. Didn't I think what happened is somebody, you know, there's a complaint form. They said somebody complained saying they were me that somebody that my page was impersonating them. And without investigating, they just took me off. So we got some media and there was a petition and so then we got a two sentence uh, you know letter about maybe a week or 10 days later and they said uh, your uh, pages or what do they call it restored it'll be up in an hour and then it just said thanks Twitter they always sign off thanks Twitter they never talked to me so it's still kind of a mystery what happened um, 
But my guess is somebody, you know, played a dirty trick on me. And then Twitter just didn't investigate and just took that complaint form at its face value. And even if it wasn't necessarily someone reporting you, it could have been automated. But just to kind of compare contrast, could you imagine this happening to any sitting member of uh, Congress, a Democrat, a Republican? It only happens to the outside voices who conveniently kind of, you know, uh, need to be suppressed for the powers that be. So, you know, uh, we can put on our tin foil, foil hats and speculate about this, but I thought that it was it was absurd to have, you know, a presidential candidate be suspended from Twitter for an arbitrary reason. Nonetheless, I had to ask you about that since I had you on. Uh, another thing that I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about is we've been hearing a lot about the prospect of Jesse Ventura jumping in the race, possibly seeking the Green Party's nomination. Now, I wanted to ask you because the Green Party's nomination is still taking place. There's other candidates running. There's Dario Hunter. There's others. Um, how would this work? I mean, assuming he wants to run for green, assuming he's going to run for president, is there any way that you and him could collaborate? Would he have to run as a separate candidate? What are your thoughts on this? Well, he has said he's supporting the Green Party this year. He joined the Green Party. Uh, it remains to be seen if he's actually going to run. You know, I think Jesse's a guy that likes to win. He's getting in late. You know, the numbers just aren't there. Um, and, you know, he has a, a mixed history on policy that, you know, the Greens are going to scrutinize. So he'd have a tough time, I believe. Uh, and, you know, it remains to be seen if he actually gets in. Um, but I welcome him getting involved. And, uh, you know, if, he, if he's not running, I'll, you know, ask for his support. He said he'd support the Green Party. And, you know, politics is about addition, not subtraction. So if he brings in people, that's good. Sure, sure. Um, I, this was before we got news that you announced your VP. Um, but in the event you hadn't selected a VP, would that be a possibility of selecting Jesse Ventura? Um, do you know if any of your opponents would have considered that? Just because I think that name recognition is a real struggle for third party candidates. So I could see value there. But I mean, you would want ideological consistency, of course, something to consider. But is that something that you would have considered if he had made this, you know, um, not announcement, but, you know, uh, floating of a candidacy sooner? Well, I chose Angela Walker because I know her. I have a rapport with her. You know, that personal chemistry is so important when you're running as a team. She knows the issues. She speaks in a way that people understand and believe her conviction. She moves people. Um, she's a younger African-American worker. She's a truck driver with a long history. She ran against David Clark, that crazy sheriff in Milwaukee County, wears the cowboy hat. Yeah, He was a Trumpy. I mean, he was... After Angela ran against him, she got 20 percent of the vote. She ran as an independent socialist back in 2014. Uh, people started dying in his jails. He was telling people to get a gun. Don't call 911. I mean, it was really somebody who had to be challenged. And, you know, Angela is that kind of person. She stepped up and uh, she's been involved. She was involved in the Wisconsin uprising as the legislative director of her amalgamated transit workers union uh, local. She was a bus driver at the time in Milwaukee. Uh, so, you know, when we talked in my campaign team, she was always at the top of the list as far as I was concerned. So I was just happy that she agreed. Um, I've never met Jesse Venture. I mean, it would take time to develop a relationship. Um, I think she balances the ticket in so many ways that I, I don't think I could have a better choice. Uh, but if, you know, Jesse doesn't run but supports us, you know, there's a role for surrogates. He can speak to his people and urge them to vote for us. Uh, and, you know, I, I would welcome that. And I respect that um, because, you know, I don't I was a little bit torn on this. Right. Because I think that name recognition is really important. But at the same time, I, I like Angela Walker. I like her. Uh, the, the fact that she's a working American. I like that she's an activist. So I do think you have to find that balance. And I thought that you made a fantastic choice. So, you know, I just kind of wanted to get your take on this because I wasn't necessarily sure what was going to happen if anything would come of that because I knew that back in 2016, and I think earlier on, you and Jill Stein had kind of been open to working with Bernie Sanders, so I wasn't necessarily sure if that was something that w would have been possible. Um, so yeah, thank you for speaking on that. You know, I don't know that he will run, but if he is trying to, you know, um, 
spread policies that are positive for working Americans, then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll support that. But yeah, I respect your decision. I think that, you know, the logic makes a lot of sense. You want people who are organizers, who are activists and who are working Americans, because, I, I you know, the when I think of idealism in America and the American dream, there's nothing more American than a truck driver, you know, running for president to be on a ticket. I, I think that's great. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. So moving on, I do want to ask you a question. This is a little bit of a controversy. So in an interview with Primo Nutmeg, you had misgendered and dead named Chelsea Manning. And just for context, um, I want to read the quote to you. You says you say this about Julian Assange. Julian Assange should not be prosecuted for publishing leaks from Bradley Manning or what what's he call himself, Chelsea. Um, so I just want to get your take on that. I don't believe that this is something that you did intentionally, but dead naming is something that's really harmful to the trans community. And I, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of respond to that. Yeah, I put my foot in my mouth. Um, this was like 70 minutes into a long interview when I got up in three at three in the morning to drive over to Massachusetts to give a speech and then did this interview. And I was worried about lunch. I was afraid I was going to miss it. And so... You know, I worked on the uh, Manning case before she transitioned. So that name popped into my head first, and I realized, whoops. And then I used the wrong pronoun. It was just an innocent mistake, and I've apologized about it, you know, many times. And uh, it's just one of those things that, you know, I, I made a gaffe, and I, you know, I apologized for it. It was a mistake. Sure. Thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to get your input on that. This is something that um, my viewers had brought to my attention that I wasn't aware of previously. Um, but thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, it, yeah, it's not... I would also add that that was over a year ago. That, it, that I think, it, well, no, I mean, it was May. It was a year ago. But people keep putting it on the internet. Yeah. You know, there's there are people that oppose me. You know, it, it's kind of a smear thing. Sure. And, uh, you know, please accept my apology. It's sincere. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about, another controversy. Um, so you had previously suggested that you believe that the 2016 Democratic Party primary was rigged. I would agree with that sentiment. And now there are other individuals running for the Green Party nomination that are saying that the same thing is virtually happening in the Green Party in 2020. Um, so I want to bring up Ian Schlackman. This is someone who was running for the Green Party nomination, but had previously suspended his campaign. And he announced that he'd be boycotting the nomination for the Green Party altogether because he believes that the process was unfair. It was tilted in your favor. And he puts forward a number of examples. He says that the individuals who were working for the Green Party apparatus as national co-chairs, they didn't step down when they started working for your campaign. So there was a conflict of interest. He also said in an interview with Primo Nutmag uh, that your campaign, the language and verbiage in particular that you put out ended up being adopted by the uh, PCSC, the Presidential Campaign Support Committee. Um, and these rules ultimately ended up disenfranchising other candidates. For example, uh, this led to a vote in uh, North Carolina where, although there were seven other candidates, you were the only one on the ballot. They say that this tried to force a two-way race between you and Dario Hunter. Can you just talk a little bit through this and your response to this? Because I, I think that one of the turnoffs for Democratic Party voters, and I speak only for myself, is the way that the party apparatus uses these types of institutional advantages that they have as leaders of the party to disenfranchise kind of the challengers. So what is your response to this? What is your response to Ian Schlackman and others who are worried about the process itself, who agree with you politically and on the policy, but think that the process wasn't necessarily fair and transparent? Ian is full of it every, in every respect. First of all, I'm not part of the National Party apparatus. I've been grinding away here in Syracuse and in New York State. I haven't been involved in the National Green Party really since we you know, got the current version, the Green Party of the United States, uh, you know, its FEC recognition and so forth and the rules uh, soon after the Nader campaign in 2000. And it actually, I lost a lot of the things I w thought about the way it should be structured. And I think it's ineffective as it's structured now. So I've been focused locally. So to say, you know, I'm pulling strings there, that's just nonsense. Now, the people that work for my campaign, they resigned from the committees. It said my campaign manager, she finished out her term, which was about a month after I announced. Um, 
Now, there are members of the steering committee or the co-chairs, uh, two of them who publicly support me. Other members publicly support other candidates. <clears throat> One of them, <clears throat> excuse me, supports <clears throat> a candidate but doesn't say so publicly. It's kind of, you talk about rigging. There's a lot of stuff, games being played. But my campaign's not playing them. As far as the rules of the presidential campaign support committee, I had nothing to do with that. I just went by the rules. The rules are, if you want to be recognized by the party, you got to file with the FEC, have a website, fill out a questionnaire, um, raise at least $1,000 from at least 100 people, and uh, there's a fifth criterion. Oh, I think you have to write a letter to the PCSC. I mean, it's really simple stuff that if you can't raise $1,000, you shouldn't be running for city council, let alone president. So that was, you know, the thinking was we get these marginal candidates. Now, they're running around saying they're excluded and it's rigged. They don't have campaigns. They just online. And so, you know, it's disappointing, you know, that people do that. And it's not constructive. And, you know, I basically ignored it. I haven't spoken out, but you brought up this guy. And, you know, what he's writing is just not true. One more thing to follow up. Him, as well as four other Green Party presidential candidates, they did pen an open letter asking for the rules to be re revised to make it more fair, um, for more transparency and accountability. Uh, going forward, like, I don't necessarily know um, what can be done so far in terms of like 2020 <clears throat> going forward how do you think constructively the green party can improve the process because even if you don't necessarily believe that what ian schlackman is saying is correct the perception for individuals such as myself it's difficult because for me i don't necessarily follow the internal politics and factionalization within the green party i'm kind of just an outsider who i support green party candidates here democrats here um, so, I mean, I agree with you on the policy, but I think that transparency and fairness is something that I do care about. So in terms of like just people like me, how, how do you improve this? How do you make the optics better? Well, I think what the PCS try, see, try to do is say we're only going to recognize serious candidates and the criteria are very low, but that didn't stop some people from stepping up. Um, and, you know, in today you can get online and say anything. So I'm not sure I do that. The process is transparent. You mentioned North Carolina. Look, each state party determines who's going to be on their ballot. Some of them go with the recognized candidates. Some of them let all comers on. Uh, California party wanted the three recognized, but the secretary of state put two others on. In North Carolina, they had a criteria and they wanted the candidates to ask the question, how are you going to get on the ballot? And at least they had 37. I don't know why they had 37 states, but that was their number. And none of the other candidates uh, answered that question. You know, we have a ballot access plan to get on all 51 states. Um, and that was the criteria they decided on. So, you know, you got to step up and meet that. I, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable question. You, know, you want to run nationally? How are you going to build a Green Party? Because getting ballot lines is one of the concrete things we can get out of this campaign. In about 40 of the states, the vote we get for president determines whether that state Green Party has a ballot line for the next election cycle. And that makes it a lot easier to run our candidates <clears throat> for local, state, and, and Congress. And in most states, it's a half a percent in New Mexico, one, two, or three percent. A few states is five percent. Alabama's 20 percent. That's the toughest one. But, you know, we can get on the ballot in a lot of states. And, you know, that's how we're going to build this. You know, uh, you talked about name recognition earlier and celebrity. You know, you can't build a party out of that. You mentioned that the people that don't vote, that's working class people, people of color, young people. And even our campaign, we may appeal to them, but that's got to be followed up with organizing, not just mobilizing, get out to vote. Organizing is the kind of thing union and community organizers do. They don't go out and preach to these people. They go out and listen and find out what's going on, how they can help, build relationships, friendships, and trust. And the way we're going to build this party is we got to have Green Party locals in these communities where the people in the community know who the activists are, that they can trust them, that they know what's going on, that they can come to them with issues. And, you know, here in New York, we ran Grandpa Al Lewis, old Grandpa Munster, and got the ballot line in 98. And then we ran celebrities in 2002 and 2006, and we failed to get the 50,000 votes we needed. 
So in 2010, we couldn't even get any celebrities to step up. So the people turned to me, and I'm a nobody. I was a teamster unloading trucks at UPS during the campaign at night. So, you know, but what we had was a good message, and we had organized it on the ground. And we got our 55, what do we got, 60,000 votes that election. Next election, almost 200,000 votes. That's when I got 5%. And, and Governor Cuomo, did I go over that? I've been talking all day to people. But with that 5%, you know, Cuomo had wanted to run up the vote, get more than his father, Mario Cuomo, got, get more than he got in 2010 to get ready to run for president. And he got less. He couldn't take us for granted. That 5%, 200,000 votes, he had to then say, well, what can I do to compete for those votes? And he adopted demands that we were raising and never supported, like a ban on fracking, a $15 minimum wage, paid family leave, and gestures toward tuition-free higher education, which were kind of phony as they panned out. But, you know, he made the move. And that's the kind of influence we can have even without winning the office. So that's why I tell people, you know, vote for what you want and make the politicians come to you. Don't waste your vote on somebody who doesn't believe what you do. Yeah, I wanted to kind of get into that a little bit more as you talk through organizing, mm -hmm. because I think that there's this misconception about the Green Party and that they don't exist until once every four years, they kind of materialize and then dematerialize once the presidential election is over. But that's not actually true. I mean, the Green Party has been consistently fielding candidates at local offices and doing organizing. Uh, for example, I've covered in my program, you know, the activism in the early net neutrality days when Obama was still president of Margaret Flowers. I thought that, you know, her protesting Tom Wheeler was really admirable. So I'm curious in terms of putting aside electoral politics um, for a moment. What do you think is the best way to affect change in terms of organizing? And how big of a role does electoral politics play in emboldening the left? Because I think that that's just one piece of that. And I think a lot of people are kind of reevaluating the role of electoral politics. How big of a role does that play? And is organizing itself actually putting pressure on these existing institutions um, as important or possibly uh, more important as actually, you know, running for office. What is your take on this? Because I know that the Green Party has been incredibly active on non-election years around issues. So, like, can you just talk through, I know this is kind of a loaded question, but for me, I'm kind of thinking through, what do we do as a collective left? And I include everyone in this category, green socialists, anyone who agrees with the policies that I want. How do we uh, at least get the policies we want if we're not able to gain, gain power. Does that kind of make sense? I know it's a little bit broad. Yeah, it's, it's a combination of movement and party. Without the social movements, the party doesn't have the energy behind it. But without the independent party, the social movements get taken for granted by the power structure. Take the Iraq war. I mean, we had such big demonstrations in the U.S. and around the world that the New York Times called us the world's second superpower. But then that movement, unlike the anti-Vietnam War movement, where we were saying out now to McCarthy and Kennedy, who were calling for negotiations, to Humphrey and Nixon. And what we found out was we had such massive demonstrations a year after the election, 69, the Vietnam moratorium in October and the massive demonstrations a month later, that Nixon and Kissinger realized if he went through with his secret plan to end the war, which was to nuke North Vietnam, he wouldn't win re-election. In fact, it might provoke a revolution. They were worried about that because we had so many people in the streets. And we weren't saying we're supporting the lesser evil. You know, against the Iraq war, the broadest coalition, United for Peace and Justice, said their, their slogan was against the Bush agenda, which is saying vote for Kerry, who was pro-war. Kerry was saying, I can fight the war better than Bush. I got a military background. I'm reporting for duty. That's what he said at the convention. And he wanted a bigger surge than Bush eventually got. And that, you know, that really hurt the peace movement. And then when, because the message was the Democrats or the peace party, when Obama got in there and is, you know, having his torture Tuesdays where he's selecting who to kill by drones, escalates in Afghanistan, uh, removes quote unquote combat troops while leaving special operations uh, going on uh, in Iraq and so forth, the peace movement was, you know, largely absent. So, uh, now, that's why the movement is so important, and it's going to be important no matter who wins the presidency in this election. On the other hand, uh, what a party can do for the movements. I mean, our problem in the social movements now is we got this nonprofit industrial complex where 
If you trace it back, they're billionaires. On the right, it's the Koch brothers. On the left, Soros gets a lot of attention, but there are others, you know, Steyer and Lewis and these other very wealthy people. And so what happens is you get groups funded, they hire staff, staff sit around a table and decide what the tactics are. And then we get a message on the internet. Move on tells you what the next thing to do is or whoever it is. And that's very undemocratic. It's very much like an electoral campaign, top-down mobilization. So people are atomized and easily manipulated because they're not talking to each other and they can't critically evaluate the situation, which happens when you're talking to each other at the grassroots. Now, what a party can do is bring people together and in a multi-issue platform, so you relate the issues and you make allies of people fighting over different issues who may be competing for media attention, supporters, and money. And a party can do that. I mean, in the labor movement, I've, I'm part of, I've gone to these labor notes conferences which promote union democracy. I've been a member of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. And they've been going since the you know, 70s. Um, but I don't think it's really going to happen until you have a party with a position on union democracy that it goes in in an organized way and, you know, fights for democracy in the unions. And, uh, you know, all the movements, there are positions that a party could, could bring in there. Because the movements tend to get, you know, patriotic and chauvinistic about their own movement versus the others. Our issues are, we're, we're more oppressed than you are. Our issues more, you know, we got to save the climate, everything else got to wait. No, we got to find a way to bring it all together. And I think that's what a party on the left can do. And uh, so that's why I think that's the missing ingredient for the left, particularly in this country, because we haven't had a party of the working class since the Socialist Party, which came close to becoming a major party. And, you know, we can go into why that didn't happen around World War One. But uh, I think it shows it's possible. But what we got to do is organize, not just mobilize, like I was talking about earlier. That I think, you know, all the left, the movements need to do. You know, we tend to mobilize. We we preach, we go out with our leaflets and our Facebook messages and everything, and we don't take the time to build relationships and get rooted in communities where people trust us. And that's, you know, union organizers know that when they're in a, you know, trying to get recognition or organize a strike or a collective bargaining fight. And community organizers know that, you know, that's how you build a base for your community organization. And it's something that uh, we need to pick up in the other social movements and with the Green Party. Yeah, that's a really thoughtful response. Um, and it kind of puts everything into perspective, uh, given the position of, I think, a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters, because myself, you know, um, I've been politically active since, you know, my college days. But now I kind of feel myself rethinking. I've been introspective lately, wondering what, do, like, how do I get the policies that we need implemented into law? What do I do to affect change? So, I mean, you, you've you been in the trenches for decades. You've been doing this for a long time. So what's the one thing, like the one piece of advice that you could give to a young activist who's just kind of getting involved in politics, you know, is being politically awakened. They just read Marx, Chomsky. What would you say to that person that's the best thing that they can do to affect change? You know, they're maybe thinking, do I run for Congress? Do I organize? Do I join DSA? Do I join Green Party? What would you say to that person? Because I feel like there's so many options that it, it's difficult. And we're, we're all kind of, we're experiencing tunnel vision, I think. We all just want to get through COVID-19. But we want solutions. And we want to we want ha to have some sense of direction. So what do you say to that kind of um, aimless person currently, if you will? Well, Michael Harrington, who I have disagreements with, I mean, he's the, the, the grandfather of today's DSA, Democratic Socialist of America, used to say, there's no such thing as an unorganized socialist. You got to be part of a group because that sharpens your thinking and it develops you because you got to learn how to speak and, and, you know, represent your thinking and other people challenge you. And, you know, that's one of the reasons of, you know, Green Party locals should be places where we develop people, their education, their ability to speak, write, um, you know, do the kind of graphics, all the things we need to learn how to do. Uh, so you got to be part of a group. And that would be my first piece of advice. Second thing I would say, study history. You want to see how social change happens? See how it has happened. And you'll also learn that most of our movements for progressive change, we lost and we lost and we lost and we lost until we won. And I've been involved in movements where we are a small minority vilified, you know, anti-Vietnam War 
in 65, 66, 67, you know, we were like, you know, a fifth column for the commies. And then in 68, after Ted, it just flipped. And, and I think in the back of people's minds, particularly those people whose sons and daughters were going off, well, mostly sons, to Vietnam because of the draft, and coming back, if not, you know, in a body bag or with a wound with mental issues, you know, really scarred, they began to question, you know, why are we fighting Vietnam anyway? And, you know, they be began to realize that there was supposed to be an election in 56 to reunify the country. Or was it, yeah, 56. And the U.S. didn't want it because they knew Ho Chi Minh would win, who had led the fight against the Japanese occupation and then the French trying to recolonize it and then the Americans. And, and he, you know, his declaration or proclamation of independence was modeled after our declaration of independence. You know, people started like that. But then he flipped anti-nuclear movement. When we started occupying the Seabrook nuclear power plant, 8% uh, of the people in New Hampshire agreed with us that nuke shouldn't be built. And we got everybody's attention by that mass occupation, 1,414 of us arrested, put in National Guard armies for 10 days, on the cover of the News Weekly's Time, Newsweek, New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, it went national. Uh, but what we did in New Hampshire is then, that was in the spring, by the next year, we brought town meeting resolutions saying, stop construction works in progress. That's where we had to pay for it before it was up and running, which wasn't a tradition. Plants weren't put in a rate base to establish rates until after they were up and running. And we went to Rock Rib Republican New Hampshire that was, you know, got its news from the Manchester Union leader, very right wing newspaper. And they said, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't pay for this thing if it isn't working. We shouldn't pay for, you know, why does this get special treatment? And they realized the public service company in New Hampshire, this nuke was like, I forget what the ratio was, like 100 times bigger than all the assets they had. It was more a Wall Street project. And, you know, that. so we won that up and down the state. We won those town meeting resolutions. And then they polled again, 80% of the people in New Hampshire were with us. So you start out as a minority, same thing with any apartheid movement. That was a case where people said, yeah, South African apartheid is terrible, but you're not gonna get your college to divest, your union to divest, your city to divest. You're not gonna get under Reagan, you're gonna get sanctions against South Africa. But we did because in 85, 86, Suddenly, we got the movement got gained momentum. We put up shanties at Dartmouth College where I had gone. Uh, we prefabbed them, brought them in a flatbed truck, planted them right in the center of the green where they do the bonfires for the football game. It was like sacred territory. And all the liberals who had sort of been intimidated by the right wing Dartmouth Review, funded by some national right wingers, they came out of the woodwork. We had 400 people out there within 20 minutes. It just totally changed the climate. And then the other campuses started doing it. And then they, Trans Africa did the it, it, civil disobedience outside the White House. Congress passed a bill that had been in there since the late 60s. Reagan vetoed it. Congress overrode it. So these are cases where we were or fracking in New, in New York. You know, it was the people most affected that were against it, but then people understood what it was. And, you know, we got 5% in 2014, and then Cuomo said, okay, that's what the people wanted. So these are all examples I've lived through where, you started out as a minority, but, you know, if you think you're right and you can persuade people, even if it's one-on-one -on -one for a while, you know, keep at it because if you study history, you'll find out that you can win. Yeah. So that's so people don't get discouraged. They should have a historical perspective and realize these things, it's like uh, in leaps, you know, it's like you're pushing against the door and suddenly it busts open and you're through. And all the people that were watching you saying, yeah, you're wasting your time, they come running through too saying, we're with you all the time. So that's how it works. And I, you know, that's what I tell young people. Get in an organization and get some historical perspective. So when, the, when it's tough going, realize that, you know, you never know when that spark's going to light the prairie fire and, and things will move. Yeah. And I think that that's really great advice, because after speaking to Dr. Harvey J.K., you know, about how radical our history is, you know, on the left and what we've managed to accomplish, you know, we're not necessarily doing anything new today. You know, it's the previous generations, people who have been in the fight like yourself, who have kind of like given us a little bit of guidance in terms of what we do. And I think that part of the problem is that all of us, especially myself, we've been hyper focused on electoral politics. And there's this, you know, I think underlying 
belief, maybe, that we can't really affect change unless we get a progressive president. But when you talk about, you know, uh, sanctions on apartheid South Africa with Reagan as president, it shows people that we have to rethink what we previously thought was possible. And, you know, for me, my, my number one goal is to make sure that regardless of what happens in these elections, people are mobilized and they stay engaged. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of push this off to you now. So speaking to the person again, going back to the beginning of this interview, where, you know, there, there's people considering checking out of electoral politics not voting altogether. Can you make your pitch to those people as to why you think they should stay involved and uh, what we can do to support your campaign? Well, people should stay involved because, you know, our lives depend on it. You know, the climate crisis is not just, you know, more heat waves and some stronger storms. It is mass species extinction, the collapse of ecosystems, the collapse of agriculture. They're climate scientists who've calculated what might happen under a business as usual scenario, and they come out with around 90% of current humanity not being able to be supported by the agriculture we could produce in the year 2100. So this is a real calamity. We talked about the nuclear arms race. And then for, you know, at least the bottom half of the income spectrum, whose average income is $18,500, that's the working poor. You know, it's a life or death issue, you know, if they can sustain a standard of living that's healthy, where they can go to the doctor. So, you know, we got to be engaged just for our own lives. And so, you know, I urge people to be engaged. And, you know, uh, I think they call it Hubert Humphrey, the happy warrior. You know, I try to think about that when, you know, things are not going well. It's like, well, you know, that comes with the territory. And, uh, you know, you should, if you have, if you believe in what you're doing, then you know that should be enough, no matter what people say. And in the long run, you know, you you persuade people, and and these movements can can advance. Um, so that's what I would say to you know people thinking about you know maybe I can't make a difference. Man, you can. You know, a small group of people. I mean, Ralph Nader says if we just had like forget the numbers, like 100 people in each congressional district pestering their member of Congress, we could transform the country because Congress doesn't hear from that many people. Um, you know, organized people can beat organized money. And, you know, while these politicians cater to the money, but when the people, they got to get the votes in the end. If they're worried about that, that's more important because they want to keep their jobs. And we got power and we have more power than we know. You know, during uh, Vietnam, you know, I mentioned how to, you know, the tactical nuke plan of Kiss that Kissinger and Nixon canceled. We didn't know it at the time. You know, it came out, you know, maybe four or five years later. In fact, Dave Dellinger, one of the leaders of the anti-war movement in that period, wrote a book called More Power Than We Know because we were winning and some of us didn't realize it and we were discouraged. So uh, that's what I would say. Now, to get involved in my campaign, you know, we have a website, HowieHawkins.us. You can get to all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and those other things there. You can read a lot of statements we put out, news releases, op-eds, policy papers, and just statements about what's going on. Uh, you can sign up to volunteer or just get our bulletins about what we're doing. You can donate. Um, we're the only campaign in the country that is seriously going for federal camp primary matching funds. And we're basically at a point now where we expect before the end of this month to qualify. We need $5,000 from 20 states in individual contributions of $250 or less. And we got a chart up there, how we're doing on ballot access. Look at your state. And even if your state is over the finish line with 100%, realize that your donation will be doubled when we qualify, up to $250. And, you know, we need that. We need people working on this campaign. I can't do this all myself. We got to get on the ballot. We just committed $10,000 to the petition in Alaska. In other states, we're going to court in this coronavirus social distancing environment, which makes petitioning unreasonable and saying, hey, you know, the Green Party has been on the ballot several election cycles. Just put us on. And Vermont did that. Illinois said, no, we took them to court and we won in court. And we're, you know, we're doing that. We got 24 ballots, which is equal to 305 electoral votes, which would be enough to win the Electoral College. But we're going for all 51 ballots, all 50 states in the District of Columbia. So, you know, people can help, and that's what we need. We need a 
little army out there, you know, magnifying our voices. If, even if it's only in this lockdown, you know, you can't go knocking on doors at this point. Although maybe that'll change. There's, we've been thinking about how to do that with proper social distancing. And uh, maybe as things open up here, uh, that'll become an opportunity. But you can always, you know, use your social media networks, friends, family, neighbors, and talk up the campaign. All right. Well, thank you so much. Howie Hawkins running for the 2020 Green Party nomination. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled to have you on the program. Hopefully you'll be back to talk about your campaign again when we have an update. I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me. Thank you.